All right, let's get started for the next session. Um, as you know, we've uh, moved the tables out a little bit, so you should have a little more um, room to move around in. Um, almost all these tables have power now or power strips. If not, you just have to poke around and look uh, for one nearby or share your power if you need it. Sometimes those strips are under the table, so if, if you look under your table, um, a couple people have had some issues with the Wi-Fi. Um, pretty much everyone should be on. If you have any trouble, talk to me or talk to Chris or find someone else as a DCC. We can get you on. Uh, the first speaker um, in this session is Ping Wing from the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. She's the ENCODE head of the Data Analysis Center, and she's going to talk about the ENCODE encyclopedia. Hey, so let me get started. Um, so we um, ENCODE, as you may realize, stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, and we're going to talk about the E in ENCODE. Um, so you have heard from uh, Mike Payson about the goals, and uh, I'm just going to go give you a little bit of the structure. So in ENCODE, we have um, excellent data producing groups and then um, Data Coordination Center, who organizes this meeting, and uh, the Data Analysis Center um, basically takes um, the data and try to, uh, one of our goal is to build the encyclopedia, which is more like um, a synthesized version of data, and we try to stay with uh, very closely with the data and try to um, be very intuitive and try to be easy to interpret. So you can access ENCO Encyclopedia from this uh, tab from the ENCO portal. And if you click about, you will see um, the introduction. So we organize the encyclopedia into three levels. And uh, the ground level, the middle level, and the top level. So um, um, a little closer up look, the ground level stays really close to data and mid-level is a little higher integration, and then top level is even more integration. And today, um, I'm going to very quickly go through these components of the encyclopedia, but very much of my talk will be focused on um, a few things uh, from each level. Um, for example, I, uh, I will spend a few more slides uh, talking about um, transcription factor chip seek peaks, a tool that we have built to visualize them and then um, how we build promoter-like regions and enhancer-like regions in a cell type specific manner. And, and then lastly, I will spend more time talking about how to link enhancer-like regions with target genes. So just a quick going through about what, what components are in each level. Um, as I said earlier, the ground level typically derived directly from experimental data. And uh, um, we, we try very hard uh, working with the DCC, Data Coordination Center, to build uniform processing pipelines. And then we run the raw data through these pipelines, and then we detect um, annotations such as um, the peaks of um, transcription factor binding, the peaks of histone mark enrichment, and uh, um, gene expression quantification. And so, one component is gene expression. So you, in, in, in you have copy to all these slides, and in these slides, um, we, we show you that uh, which ENCODE groups produce this data, and uh, which ENCODE groups worked on data visualization or analysis. So I'm not gonna go, due to the time, interest of time, and I'm not gonna name everybody, but you, you can see that which groups are um, contributing uh, which components. So for example, um, um, you can see that um, in gene expression, you can see all these cell types, and then um, for a particular gene, uh, how the expression pattern is like. And uh, for transcription factor binding, uh, we have many ChIP-seq data, and uh, um, I will spend a few slides talking about a tool we have built, my lab, for visualizing aggregate peaks, which are enriched genomic regions that are bound by transcription factors. And uh, 
So um, these two is called a uh, factor book. So you can access it um, through factorbook.org and it also gets connected directly from the ENCODE portal. Um, so the goal is to visualize, summarize the data centered on individual TFs and uh, such summarized data may not be easy to access, um, may not be easy to see on the genome browser and then we also try to link them with um, histone profiles, sequence motifs, and uh, heat maps of these um, peaks across the whole genome. So it's a TF-centric view, and uh, we hope to uh, build the same process for ChIP-seq of histone and DNA data sets as well. So if you look at Factorbook, um, you can have a glance as to how many ChIP-seq TF data sets the ENCO consortium has produced, hundreds of data sets, and then you can browse factor by factor and uh, when you go into each page of the factor, you can see the 3D structure, um, distilled function information, and any link to external resources. And then um, if you take all the chip seek peaks across the genome, we show aggregate plots like this. Um, how does um, each kind of histone mark look like um, in the vicinity of these uh, chip seek? Uh, TF peaks. And we also have uh, data for um, histone profiles in two cell types, and you can also see them. Um, we segregate the chip seek peaks um, into two groups, um, transcription uh, star psi TSS proximal and TSS distal regions, and you can see they have uh, pretty distinct different profiles for the histone uh, occupancy. And you can also uh, look at the en enrichment of uh, sequence motifs in these chip seek peaks. Um, we show top five peaks. This is, uh, we show top five motifs, excuse me. This is motif one. And we filter our data so you can see all five motifs that are enriched, in this case, in back one chip seek peaks. And then these two we think are more likely to be biologically meaningful and those um, may be false positives, but we still keep them in case um, they are cofactors uh, motifs. And uh, this is the heat map I mentioned earlier. So um, each column is a chip seek peak and then the entire heat map is um, all the chip seek peaks across the entire genome. So this is a pivot TF, in this case BRAC1, and then you can uh, look at all these chip seek peaks for BRAC1 and see whether or not um, there are histone marks around these peaks across the genome that are correlated with the chip seek of BRAC1 or other TF binding. So um, that just was a very quick, quick summary as to um, one method for visualizing these chip seek peaks. And go back to the ground level annotation, we also have a lot of um, histone mark chip seek data and we also detect peaks using um, these uh, data sets. And uh, you have heard um, DNA seq data. We, we also detect peaks and also uh, DNA's binding footprints from these uh, data. And one um, Job Decker's group uh, produces high C data from high C, which is um, uh, chromatin structure data, and you can. Um, analyze them and then derive uh, topologically associated domains. These are TEDs and then compartments. So you can show here, um, these are TED boundaries in green and then the compartments in red and blue. And we also have chia pad data and from chia pad data you can uh, derive links between promoters and distal regulatory elements um, visualized as loops here. And uh, um, we also have a lot of DNA, RNA binding protein, um, occupancy data produced by uh, e Eclipseq, and then from Eclipseq you can see these um, peaks and then also binding sites. Um, so that just summarizes um, all the ground level annotations and you can go in and look at each one and um, download them. Um, they are all available from the ENCODE portal. So let me move on to the middle level annotations and uh, middle level annotations integrate multiple types of experimental data and then ground level annotations. And uh, um, I'm going to focus on two types of middle level annotations. One is to predict 
enhancer-like regions using um, uh, biochemical data, very specifically um, among the many types of biochemical data we have in ENCODE, there are DNA-seq and then um, and a whole battery of histone mark chip-seq data. And upon analysis of in individual types of these data, we found that um, two of them stand out, uh, DNA-seq and H3K27AC chip-seq, to be excellent marks for enhancer activity. So um, the, uh, we, we uh, analyzed uh, different methods to, uh, to try to combine these um, two types of data to see how we can best predict enhancer-like regions. And we want the, the method to be unsupervised because we want the method to be applicable to a large number of cell types. So, um, so the rationale is that um, we will use um, the very rich matrix of histone mark and uh, DNA data um, built uh, from on mouse because we have um, a, a number of histone modification chip seq data by Bing Ren's lab, and then we have RNA seq data, we have DNA methylation, we have DNA seq um, on a whole matrix of uh, mouse development. And we have run through, um, run these data through the uniform processing pipelines. So here is the whole matrix of data, and the columns indicate developmental time points, and the rows indicates cell type. So as you can see that uh, for, um, for E11.5, uh, we have a number of cell types for which we have both H3K27AC and uh, DNAs available in the same cell type. So we decided to combine the data available in the cell type along with experimental validation of enhancers um, generated um, by Len Panacchio's uh, group um, integrated into the VISTA database. So we can compare these data with uh, functional data to see what kind of model will be best in predicting enhancer-like regions. So uh, a little bit about VISTA. So uh, it's um, mouse transgenic assays. So you take clips of DNA and then you inject into mouse embryo and with a reporter, so you see um, which cell type the reporter is expressed that will indicate enhancer activity in that specific cell type. So we have over 2,000 regions that have been tested and uh, um, they, um, so for, for several tissue types such as limb, brain, subregions, there are over 200 active enhancers. So we decided to combine these with in ENCODE chip-seq data and then compare to see which model works best. So these are different regions. You can see that um, four brain enhancers um, light up in four brain and mid brain enhancers light up in mid brain, so on and so forth. So um, in model testing, we um, considered a number of options. So um, if you want to detect Enhancer-like regions, um, as I said earlier, DNAs and uh, H3K27AC peaks work really well. But how do we center our predictions? Do we center on DNA peaks or do we center on K27AC peaks? This question actually came up earlier, um, I think during Chris's talk. Um, some, some, someone in the audience asked, have you used uh, histone mark? So we consider which one will work better. So how do we rank these peaks? Do we rank them by p-value? Do we rank them by chip-seq or DNA-seq raw signal? Um, do we incorporate additional signals such as DNA methylation, other histone mark? So we um, used enhancer, uh, VISTA enhancer data set to, to evaluate all these options. So um, we can uh, come up with a model and then uh, predict the peaks and uh, compare with uh, VISTA regions to see whether or not um, they are true positives, uh, they are false positives, false negatives. Um, obviously, because the VISTA enhancer regions um, are relatively few compared with um, all, all possible regions in the genome that could be enhancers, so we don't really have a good handle in true negatives. But um, these other three um, evaluation we can make pretty well. 
So because we don't really have a true hand, good handle on uh, true negatives, uh, we use these uh, precision and the recall evaluation. Um, precision is an evaluation of um, among all the predictions you can make, what percentage of them are actually true. Recall is just sensitivity among all the VISTA enhancers, how many of them your model can capture. And this PR curve is partic particularly relevant in genome-wide predictions when the fraction of positives is very small, uh, much less than 50 percent. So we get a curve, and then as you can see here, there are five different ways of evaluating how you should score these peaks, and uh, the blue curve behaves the best on the top, and that is an average rank of DNA signal and the K27 AC signal. So this is a very, very simple model and uh, easy to interpret and easy to apply to um, multiple cell types. So at the end, we decided to center our predictions of enhancer-like regions on DNA peaks. Um, they work better than uh, if, I do, if we do that on K27 AC peaks. And we also found using our training and testing set, incorporating additional data didn't significantly improve performance using our test set. Um, because we really want to stick with a highly interpretable model, an easy model, so we decided to leave these other additional information out at the, for the time being. So how does the model work? You take DNA peaks in a particular cell type, and then you look at the signal, measure the signal, and then you also take K27 AC signal in the same cell type, and uh, you take windows. So. Um, it has been mentioned earlier that very often you will observe DNA signal um, in the trough of K27 AC signal. So the combination of these two uh, is particularly powerful. And we get the rank, and then we average the rank. And the average rank is basically our prediction as to how likely a region is to be enhancer-like. So um, we, um, we annotate this region with a DNA peak in, in the middle and then the entire region according to HCK27 AC peak. So you can visualize them. So here is an example of uh, such an enhancer-like region in neural tube. And you can see that this region has been um, tested using um, reporter uh, mouse transgenic assays and it lights up in neural tube. And uh, the prediction is spot on. Um, and you can see this very beautiful um, signal between K27 AC and the DNAs, and this indicates that um, it's a very strong um, prediction. So we applied very, just very quickly, we applied a very similar approach to predict enhancer-like, uh, promoter-like regions, and um, in this case, we are trying to uh, predict gene expression. So we also use the same ap approach to evaluate different models, and we looked at um, all kinds of histone marks and the DNAs, and um, we want to ap apply the method to as many cell types as possible. So here we are trying to predict the expression of a gene, and we rank the expression, and then we can rank them by each possible histone mark or DNAs, and see which one works the best. So in this example, you can see that um, uh, each dot here is a gene, and uh, H3K27, uh, H3K27, 3K4ME3 um, is very good in predicting expression, and you get an R square of 0.63. DNAs by itself is not as good as H3K4ME3. R square is only 0.37. Uh, H3K27AC signal by itself is also not as good as H3K4ME3. But um, very similarly, as we found out, if you combine H3K4ME3 signal with a healthy dose of DNA signal, you can improve um, the correlation to R squared of 0.65, and also you get a lot fewer ties um, at a high expression level. So that's what we end up using. This is our simple model of combining H3K4ME3 and DNAs for predicting promoter-like regions. So here's an uh, example um, in the lymphoblastoid cell type, and you can see that uh, enhanced uh, promoter-like regions with DNA signal in the middle and then with um, flanking H3K4ME3 signal, very strongly agreeing with uh, the transcription star side of NGENCO <coughs> genes. 
So uh, we, we have built a, a visualization tool for visualizing these enhanced-like and promoter-like regions in a cell type specific manner. And here is the link that we have made. And uh, here, um, so the goal is that um, we, we have a proof of concept. Please, if you have time in, during break, um, give it a try. And uh, we're very interested in knowing whether or not you find this tool to be useful. And eventually, we would like to implement this tool at the DCC um, to be integrated into the portal. So here is the visualization. Um, so you first uh, choose a genome you are interested in. And you can query this tool either by gene, by SNP, or by genomic coordinate of the region you are interested in. And in, in this matrix down below, you can pick the cell type that you work on. And then at the end, you just you can visualize the region in, in either the UCSC or the WashU genome browser, and they show, show up like this. Um, so here is an example region, and you can see that these are the regions we predict to be enhanced-alike. And then alongside, we display the DNA seq signal in orange and the H3K27 AC signal in blue. So here is one cell type, which is thymus, and then next cluster of data is another cell type, yet another cell type, and then you can turn on any other um, tracks you want to compare with, along with the predictions here. So um, for, for those um, cell types that um, we do not have both DNAs and H3K27AC data, um, you can also, we have also made similar predictions of enhanced-like regions using just the DNAs, seq data, or just H3K27AC data. Um, both of them individually um, are very good predictors of enhanced activity. And you can visualize alongside with the same tool. And eventually, we want to integrate into um, the DCC and then show up with this kind of uh, uh, matrix view. Um, so it's, it's much easier to pick and choose the data sets. <clears throat> so <clears throat> those were the examples of um, middle-level uh, annotations. So for the top level annotations, we, we aim to integrate a broad range of experimental data as, long, as well as the lower level uh, annotations. So one component of the top level annotation are the chromatin states. So um, here is um, an output of uh, Chrom HMM. And uh, you can see that um, this, this image is actually epi logo. Each row is um, Chrom HMM output in a particular cell type. And uh, across all these cell types, and you can see that um, the promoter state in red is highly conserved across cell types. And then um, yellow is um, enhancer states, and green is transcribed gene, gene body states. So this, is give you a, this gives you a bird's eye view of uh, chromatin states across many cell types. So you will hear about Regulum DB and HeparReg, and then also FunSeq2. These are um, ENCODE methods for um, trying to visualize um, GWAS um, SNPs along with annotation. So the last bit, um, I just want to talk about um, predicting target genes of enhancers. So that's a component of the top level annotation. So you have um, heard from earlier talks about um, how important it is to predict target genes of enhancers because very often um, you want to know which genes are causal of which phenotypes. So again, very similar to our earlier approach for predicting enhancer-like regions. Um, here, we want to create brand benchmark data sets for comparing methods that are very commonly used. Um, you have heard about this correlation-based method from the previous talk. Um, basically, you have a DNA signal across a panel of cell types. If um, they correlate between an enhancer and a gene, you may say that enhancer is regulating that gene. That's one of the predominant methods in the field. And we want to know how well it works. And we want to know whether or not if you in incorporate additional data, do you improve the performance? And obviously, be for a consortium, we want to um, get input from different groups and compare other methods. So very quickly, um, for benchmark data set, 
uh, we started out with a promoter capture high C from um, Osborne's group um, earlier. So basically, this is like high C, but enriched for promoter uh, based links. And we started out to integrate additional data sets using GM12A7A, uh, which is a tier one and co cell line for which we have so much data. So we incorporated the chia pair data, which is a chromatin structure, again, um, using um, red 21 as the, the, the factor you chip down. And then we incorporated EQTLs in uh, lymphoblastoid cells um, from HEPOREC. And then we incorporated the very high quality high C loop from uh, the Aiden lab. And so you can see that um, if you take these three data sets we intersect, um, they don't intersect very much uh, between pairs of them. And then the, the middle indicates how many of the enhancer promoter links that intersect with the promoter capture high C. Okay, so we basically take the regions in the middle to be our training set. But this is ongoing work, and uh, we have additional data. But this, this result I'm showing you here is pretty stable. So if you look at these, um, um, the, the enhancer um, target gene links in this um, region in the middle, and you make a distribution in, in the distance between the enhancer and the target gene. And I think people asked earlier, you know, do you get the nearest gene as your target gene? Um, so you can see that this is an absolute uh, distance uh, uh, in KB. So you can see if you make a cutoff at 100 KB, you basically lose a third of the links. Um, but if you go up to 500 KB, um, you, you will lose 3%, okay? So this is, this is a very strong uh, distance dependence. So um, those were the positives. So in order to train a method, you also need to have negatives. So we basically um, pick the genes that are also in 500 KB, but not linked by any of those data sets, um, promoter, capture, high C, high C, high quality, high C, th those four data sets. So those we treat as negatives to evaluate the math model. So um, we divide our um, data into a training set, validation set, and test set. And uh, roughly 5% of the cases are positive. This is uh, pretty typical because uh, many of the links are actually not, not real. So um, we evaluated a bunch of methods, correlation-based methods. So um, you, can, you can get a signal of um, different types of histone marks or DNAs in enhancer region with the promoter, and then um, you perform correlation calculation across a panel of cell types or tissue types. And uh, this is not as simple as it, as it sounds because um, you could correlate the raw signal or you could perform z-score normalized um, correction for your raw signal and then correlate the z-score. Or you could correlate DNAs, you could correlate K27AC, um, you could use all ENCO cell types, you could use roadmap cell types, you could use um, Pearson Spearman. So, so basically, not to be labeled the point, there are a lot of choices you could use, right? We wanted to know which one works better. So here, um, you can see this is a rock curve, um, true positive rate versus false positive rate. Um, the best method will go all the way up, all the way around. Um, so um, as you can see that um, black works the best, which is an average rank of K DNAs and K27AC. That gives you an area under the curve of 0.76, okay? Normalize the signal works better than raw signal, and DNAs works a bit better than K27AC. Um, this is the same performance, but just plotted on the precision recall curve. As I mentioned, only 5% of the, the links are true positive, and that's why it's very important to do PR curve calculation because um, this rock curve normalizes um, the ratio between positives and negatives. So for genome-wide test, PR is a more realistic evaluation. So you can see they don't, none of these methods work great because for, for PR curve, the best method will go from the top and all the way down. Okay, so none of these work really great. So um, here are some examples. In some cases, correlation really works very well. So in this case, um, so the target gene is TLR10, and then here is the promoter that correlation predicts 
that, that's regulating that promoter. And you can see if you plot um, K27AC signal across a bunch of cell types, here each dot is a different cell type, you see that um, the, the promoter lights up only in GM1287A, and also the enhancer only lights up in that. So this is most likely to be a real link. Um, here is an, another example that's likely not to be real, just because as you can see that um, um, average K27 AC across the promoter is very high, but in GM it's actually not that great. So this is likely to be a false positive predicted by correlation. So we talked earlier about distance information. Distance is a very strong feature in predicting enhancer gene links. But if you use a very hard cutoff, like 100 KB, you miss a third of the links. So can you be more intelligent? Can you use a quantitative method to incorporate distance? So um, you can do something very simple just to see how big impact it is. So you can rank target genes by the distance to an enhancer, okay, and see how well it works. And then you can compare that with your correlation, and then you can average the ranks between the distance and the correlation to see if it improved, just to, to, to tell whether or not how much it's contributing. So here is the black line, is the performance if you just use correlation, okay? And green line is if you just use distance. You see, if you just use distance, you actually do better than if you just use correlation. But if you combine correlation with distance using a very simple-minded, just averaging the rank, you do better than both of them. So this is the rock curve, and this is the PR curve. The improvement on PR curve is even more substantial, and this is the curve we actually care about for genome-wide prediction. Um, so just a very quick conclusion um, for the predominant method for predicting target genes, which is correlate DNA signal or histomark signal across a panel of cell types. DNA slightly outperforms K27AC. And it's better to use Z-score normalized signal and not raw signal, which makes sense because raw signal is, you know, not normalized. It's probably going to be very dependent on sequencing depth and other issues. And if you use Pearson correlation coefficient, it outperforms Spearman. And ranking by correlation coefficient outperforms ranking by p-value, which is really good news because p-value takes a lot longer time to compute. And if you incorporate distance information, that drastically increases performance. And uh, can you do even better by just ranking distance and correlation? Sure. So what we aim to do is to develop um, a machine learning algori algorithm. Um, specifically, we use this random forest model. Um, we want to have a minimum model that can be applied to a whole battery of cell types and tissue for which we have ENCODE data for. And he, here we will incorporate DNA signal, K27AC signal, the correlation, and then some sequence dependent features. And then for some of the ENCODE cell types for which we have a lot more data, we can uh, make a more comprehensive model. So just very, very quickly, um, so here is what we get at this point. Um, if you use these features, um, distance, average conservation, average DNA signal, average K27AC signal. This is a sequence-based features, just KMERS, just trinucleotide, hexanucleotide, correlation between enhancer and, and target gene. And if you combine all that into the um, random forest machinery, so you can see that, um, again, black is um, correlation um, alone, and, and orange is um, the average rank between distance of correlation, and then this purple line is random forest using the minimal model of those features that I mentioned in the previous uh, slide. So you can see, you see a market improvement. This is rock curve and even more drastic improvement for PR curve. And this is really the region we care a lot about and you see a very big improvement. Um, and you can, uh, Random Forest gives you a, a quantification as to which features are important. So the most important that contributes the most is distance. And uh, below that, you see a lot of promoter features uh, contribute uh, quite a bit, slightly more than the features based on enhancers. 
Um, so I mentioned that for, for some of the ankle cell types, we can have a comprehensive model. And here, we just want to share a little bit of results on gene expression. So how well can you do when you add other, inform other features, and specifically gene expression? That really helps. So when you add gene expression, now you get this um, purple line. It's, it's definitely better in rock curve. And it's, again, markedly better in the pink R curve. So um, if you look at the, the uh, feature contribution, indeed, expression is a very important feature, expression of the target gene. Okay. So um, basically, um, here is uh, we, we have a pretty simple model. We have implemented um, uh, the results using GM12A7A. And if you go to the visualizer I mentioned earlier for visualizing enhancer-like regions, promoter-like regions, there is a tab for visualizing uh, enhancer target gene links in GM12A7A. We are in the process of implementing these models um, after the discussion with other ankle groups. We are going to implement it across the entire panel of ankle cell types. Um, so we are in the process of evaluating additional training and testing data. Um, and uh, um, we recently found um, a chia pad of PAL2 to work really well. So um, we have some new results. Don't change the conclusions here, but overall the performance is better. And um, um, we can retest additional features if we have a um, training set, a larger training set, because we don't want to overfit. And um, obviously, this is one of the key challenges and is to predict target genes. I think a lot of people are interested in that. Um, so um, let me just conclude my talk by thanking the people uh, who did the work. So um, in my lab, um, there are five uh, really talented uh, students who contribute to um, the work in Encyclopedia. Joe Moore um, is the ring leader for, for these five people. And then uh, we used, uh, we had lots of discussion with John's group about DNA data. And then we worked with um, Mark Gerstein's group on predicting enhancer-like regions, uh, Mark and Analog. And we're very grateful to all the wonderful data in the ANCO consortium and the uh, um, visa enhancer and the mouse data. And, and it's a fun place to work. Okay, any questions? I was wondering if you could say some more about how with your definition of enhancer and promoter you're able to discriminate between enhancers and promoters because sometimes you'll have DNAs in H3K27 acetylation also have promoters and what is the overlap between your enhancer and promoter set? Right, that's a really good question. So if you use um, both DNAs and uh, H3K27AC, by combining them, we do get a lot of the regions that are just promoters. They are right like, at the TSS. Um, right now, we don't have a functional definition as to whether or not these are actually promoters or promoters that may function also as enhancers. So right now, we don't dis discriminate them any other way, but in visualization, so we color them differently. So we're, we're hoping to serve end users who, who will be more like locus specific. They'll go in, and if a region is really close to a TSS, we give it a different color. And we also make predictions using K4ME3. So um, if the prediction using K4ME3 gets a higher signal than the prediction using K27AC, this probably would be more likely, more likely a promoter region. Uh, just a very uh, technical question. So I'm very interested about predicting target uh, genes for enhancers. Mm -hmm. um, how is it, is it your method available and which kind of data do you need as an input? So because I guess you, you need to train, um, you need a, a training set and then um, a test set? Right. Uh, do you need high C? Uh, so, um, you know, the, the first section uh, of the last portion of the talk, I know it's there are lots of slides. So it was about building this benchmark. Mm -hmm. So we have this benchmark that includes um, cheer pad, high C, you know, promoter capture high C, um, EQTL, so anything that could um, indicate enhancer gene links. So we compile those as a benchmark. We, we will 
we will release the benchmark as well so that people can compare their performance. So that's the, 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 the yardstick for us to evaluate this, all these options of the methods. But if I have like a few snips for what I'm interested in, uh, can I run your method? Well, um, sure. I mean, you, um, hopefully we have already run the method on all the ENCO data types. Unless you have your own data type, sure. You should be able to, we will definitely, in the ENCO spirit, we will release the method. So here are the features we use for, um, for the model. And then, you know, if you, um, if you only have DNAs or only have K27AC, we believe still works pretty well. So we could make variants of the method and make it available. But right now the plan is to build this encyclopedia so we run the method on all the, ENCO, the whole panel of ENCO cell types. So you can, you can just go and visualize your region with your SNP. Okay. Thank you. Can you compare the performance of your predictions with the Chrome HMM and Segway? I mean, they're doing a lot of similar things, especially like enhancers and promoters. Yeah, that's a really question. So are you asking about the performance of predicting the enhancer-like regions like or predicting a, links? Maybe like a functionally validated, yeah, as well as links. Um, so I think it's more appropriate uh, to compare the performance for predicting the enhancer-like regions themselves because Chrome HMM um, doesn't really predict target genes. Jason is sitting there, unless I'm wrong about it. Just identify the regions, right? So um, we have, I forgot to include those slides. Um, we have done enrichment analysis, and the regions we picked out using this simple approach um, is very strongly enriched in the enhancer states the regions that are assigned by, by Chrome HMM to be enhancer state, so active enhancers, so highly enriched. But, you know, exactly, you know, in how, how well one works the, the, than the other, um, we, we don't have a really good gold standard to compare. But what we're saying is um, this is a very intuitive approach, just really simple, and you can see the signal in front of your eyes. Um, there is good reason to think perhaps uh, Chrome HMM could do better because it's integrating across multiple histone marks, right? It's using more input. Um, certainly, as part of the encyclopedia, we also have Chrome HMM predictions available, so you can visualize them in combination. Yes. Maybe she needs a microphone. <laughs> Yell. Yeah. No, it's coming. The microphone is coming. Um, so, you know, um, I guess this is just a little bit el elaboration on the question that was just being asked. So if, um, you know, I want to run this analysis on a bunch of SNPs, I understand and I take your point that if we have leads um, and a bunch of like four or five SNPs or ten or two, at least even like, you know, hundred SNPs, then okay, I can go one by one and uh, visualize this and therefore shortlist. But mm -hmm. if I want to start with like 50,000 or, or, you know. Ah, um, you are saying that's way too many. Way too many. Mm -hmm. Then um, is there a way to access or like will this co code be or uh, available, mm -hmm. you know, for us to be able to use and mm -hmm. further shortlist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the visualization tool we have built, um, you, could, um, you could batch download the data if you so choose. So we will make the download available. But also, um, I think we should allow people to upload a file to signify a list of regions. Right. Would that address your question? Yes. Okay, so we, we can easily implement that functionality. Okay. So you can upload like a bad file with 3,000 regions and then you can download the results. Thank you.